Well, hey guys, welcome back to the Culture Maker Podcast. Great to have you with me. If you haven't met me before, my name is Mike Edwards, and this is the podcast that's all about helping dads create healthy cultures in their homes. And uh, yeah, today I'm actually taking you to church. (laughs) I don't know how many of you uh, go to church or have been in church lately, Um, but today that's why I'm taking you. I was was asked recently to speak at my church, uh, which is um, called Curate. Uh, and that's in Mount Maunganui, New Zealand. And I did a culture, uh, a, uh, a message on how we uh, create healthy cultures inside of our homes as men, and and the importance of that for us dads. And listen, if you um, if you normally don't go to church, if you wouldn't call yourself a religious person, that's fine. I think you'll still. Um, be um, challenged and inspired by this message. I hope you enjoy it. And um, yeah, so let's get into it. Yeah, so hey, most of you won't know me, um, but my name's Mike Edwards. And um, yeah, it's the first time on the stage, actually. And as Hayden said, it's been a while since I spoke. Last time I preached, I had hair and I didn't have glasses. So <laughs> well, that happened. Um, but we've been a part of this church for about four and a half years now, I think. I actually just made that up. I don't know my wife would know. In fact, I think I asked her and she told me and I wasn't listening. <laughs> um, so, um, but yeah, my lovely wife, Julie, is right there. And we normally sit back in there. We come to the 6 p.m. service and there's some lovely ladies keeping my seat warm for me there during the day, so that's great. Um, so, uh, a bit of family here. My youngest son, Jack, is here somewhere. He may be out at Ignite. Uh, but yeah, Jack's normally uh, out at Ignite. I've got my two lovely daughters here, Jess and Cairns. Hey, girls, looking good. <laughs> um, normally, there's Luke and Ashley, my son Luke, um, and his wife, Ashley. They normally sit at the front here. You'll recognise Luke. You'll recognise the back of his arms because he's normally, he wants to be really close to God and, you know, he's got his arms up like that, and so you'll see the back of his arms. I'm normally at the back, and I just can't, just can't see the words. Um, and then there's Josh and Kaylee. I think they'll probably be here at 11, maybe, or maybe not. Um, my daughter, Josh. No? <laughs> Man. Yes, Josh would like that. Um, my daughter, Kaylee, and his, her wife, Josh. Wow. <laughs> Man. They've got their gender, it's, it's hard, it's, nowadays, you know, it's a bit tricky, but. Um, so, and uh, they have their two, their two kids, Miles and Oakley, two of our grandkids, and, um, and then our older son, Sam and Millie, they go to uh, the Redeemer Church in Taranga, and they've got a child, Abigail, and they've got another kid, which is due pretty much now. So, so as Hayden said, I have, we have six kids, and so the, our house was quite a handful, and in addition to that, we actually fostered 37 more. So, yeah, crazy, crazy days. And um, all of that doesn't mean we're perfect parents. It just means that we made a whole lot more mistakes than most people. <laughs> um, but we did learn along the way just how important it is to create a healthy culture for your kids. Um, and that's what we're going to look at today, because I believe the New Testament... Um, And actually the Old Testament, the whole Bible really, is a call to be his kingdom culture makers. Yeah, and uh, the challenge us dads have is that we have a very specific commission to recreate his kingdom culture, his family culture, right inside of ours. And that's what we're going to look at today. So we're going to start off, um, put these on, we're going to start off in Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to read verses 21 to 25. It's not the sort of the whole, wow, there's a thing there. Um, (laughs) Do you stand there when you want to be like, right there? No. Um, So, yeah, we're going to read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 to 25. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is his the saviour of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so your wives should submit to your husbands and everything. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church and he gave up his life for her. If you've been in church for a while, you'll know these verses. If you've been married for a while and you've been in church, you'll you'll know these verses. They're verses we know but we don't really love. 
Um, and when we read them, we, we get all mixed up and we get all confused and we wonder who's leading and who's submitting. You know, we wonder who's the leader and who's the servant. And we, we, we miss the heartbeat of it because this is a mandate. These are a mandate to recreate his culture, his family culture inside of our family, to bring his culture into our homes. And um, to help land the plane on that, rather than the land of right there, I'm going to jump away to uh, the parable of the lost son. But before I do, or just on the way there, I don't know whether you've ever thought about it, but Jesus was God's son. I think we've kind of worked that out, right? But um, Jesus came here and he actually represented, he did the will of his father. And in that sense, we got a real, we got a sneak peek of what it's like inside God's family culture. It's like we got a sneak peek almost around the dining room table in heaven or the lounge. We got, we got a sense of what their family culture was like. And, and the, the funny thing is people didn't like it. They struggled with it. They didn't understand it. They just didn't get it. And so what Jesus did is he told a whole bunch of parables to help us understand uh, what the family culture was like. And in Luke chapter 15, he told this three parables, the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost sheep, and the parable of the lost son. And I'm not going to read the whole, um, the whole story, but um, I'm going to read verses 11 to 21 in Luke 15. A man had two sons. The youngest son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. It's like the son is saying, I'm done here. I just want your money. I don't care for this family anymore. I don't, I don't really get, I don't, I, I'm not, I want to be part of this anymore. I want to go away and I want to live life different. And he did. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. And a few days later, his son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home even the hired servants have food enough to spare and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and earth, uh, sorry, against heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and whilst he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him and kissed him, and he said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Uh, the story goes on, and if you haven't read that parable before, I really encourage you to read it. It's a great story. Um, I have a lifestyle block, otherwise known as a life sentence block. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a long driveway. It's like 400 metres long, and it goes down like this, and then it goes up like that. And none of the kids like walking it, do they, girls? No. <laughs> Um, but at the top of our driver, you, you're sort of just getting to the ridge of a hill. You can't really see much in the immediate distance. You can sort of see the, the hills far off. But I, when I read this story, I imagine the father's homestead sort of sitting at, a, at, the, at the top of a field that just sort of flow out into the distance. And I imagine this father walking to the end of his drive or the end of the fields every day, just waiting for his son to come home. And he does that for years. And then one day he sees his son and he just runs to him and embraces him and kisses him. And this is a father. If you forget about the father of the story, this is actually Jesus telling us a story of his heavenly father, of what it's like, of what, what, what God is like. And this is a, a father that you can't even, you can't even look at. Right? When, when you see God talked about when you see stories of God right through the Old Testament, you see a story of a God that you kind of have to be sort of shrouded so that you didn't die when you looked at him. You had to be, you had to, you had to be really sort of protected from him. And when he turned up, you had to take his sandals off 
so that you, because the, the ground was holy. His, this is a God whose standards are so high, he had to send his son so that, just so that we could draw near to him. And yet this is a father that we can run to. So we see a picture of a father who because of his big grace, even though he's, his standards are so high, because of his big grace, he's easy to run home to. Um, us men are great at bringing the fun. Uh, that's why I played those videos at, at the front. I think we've all sort of done half of those things, at least with our kids. Um, and when I, when I see those, I'm reminded of my dad and the fun that he made for us. And my, my mum's actually here today, and it's great to see you, mum. Um, dad's no longer with us, but he, he just made so much fun, didn't he, for us. <clears throat> I didn't mean to tear up just then. Um, <clears throat> but I also can remember the fun that I had with my kids and, and just trying to make a fun environment. And, um, and I, I actually got a mental picture of my brother and uh, my younger brother. He's just a young dad. He's, he's just 50. And, um, <laughs> but he's actually a young dad. He started really late. And so his, his daughters are tiny. And um, I got a picture of him last time I saw him. He's on all fours, and there's two girl, young girls on his back, and he's horsing around and neighing and bucking, and the girls are falling off and giggling. And um, We bring the fun, and, and this is actually something that research shows is what dads do. We do this globally, whether it's New Zealand or the US or China or India or Africa, dads bring the fun. The other thing dads do is we bring the, the rules. We seem to sort of jump from the fun, and the next thing we do is we, when dads, when the rules need to happen, when something, you know, the standards need to be brought, dads bring that. And so we tend to uh, play the fool and bring the rules. But unless our lives are full of the big grace of our Heavenly Father, then we're just fools with rules. See, I think the thing is, a lot of us dads can be really hard to draw near. A lot of us dads can be actually quite hard to talk to. Uh, I've got a dad in mind in particular, he basically doesn't say anything. You can hang out with him for a while and for half an hour, and he, you'd be lucky if you get a grunt out of him. And a lot of us dads don't have a lot to say. We also can really struggle with the emotional chaos inside of a home. Um, homes can be sort of all emotional, and a lot of us dads are just like, what the heck, we, we just struggle with it. Or, if you're a bit more like me, you're just completely oblivious to what's going on at home half the time. <laughs> right? And then you add to that our high standards, and, which are important, but they're present. And so there is a sense that we, we can be really hard to draw near. But like our Father in this parable, our Heavenly Father, we need to be easy to run to. And see, the thing is, Jesus bridged the gap he made it easy to approach God. And he, he did that by creating a unique culture here on earth. And he told us to recreate that in our homes. <clears throat> so the parable about our Father in heaven and Jesus' very own life, I don't know whether you've even thought about this, but Jesus' life demonstrated that culture is made in the middle. You know, what I mean by that is we think our culture as dads is made when we're bringing the fun, or bringing the standards, but Jesus shows us that it's made in the middle. When, when people questioned him. I don't know whether you realize that, but Jesus' whole life was, was full, of, full of conflict. People challenging him, and people questioning him, people disappointing him, and people failing him. And that's where Jesus created the culture. His reactions defined a culture that changed the world. And he's asked to bring that inside of our homes. And when he, we do that, we change our world for us and for our kids. I don't know whether you've thought about this also, but Jesus' standards were so much higher than the Pharisees, but his load felt so much lighter. 
Yeah, the Pharisees would often say, this is the standard. And then Jesus would go, nah, it's this. And his standards were so much higher, but his load was so much lighter. And because of that, he attracted all sorts of sinners, it's described. There's this sort of moment in, in Jesus' life um, that's recorded in a few of the, the, the different Gospels. And I like the one recorded in Mark 2.15. And it says, Later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. And the reason I like this one in Mark is because it's the only one that says there were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. So he had a whole bunch of sinners that would hang out with him, and it doesn't really explain what type of sin they were into, but it, it, the idea is that they were really immoral. They were actually living terrible lives, and they were broken, and they were the outcasts. They didn't feel loved or accepted by anybody, and yet they somehow, despite Jesus' high standards, they felt comfortable to hang out with him. How did he do that? I actually wonder how we, how we did that. I, I don't think we get a clear view in Scripture to how we actually created those kind of environments around him. And I, I, wish he, I wish he'd sort of gave us the, well, this is how I did it. But that's our challenge as um, parents, is to work out how to hold our high standards, but also to create an environment where our children don't feel judged. And in case you're wondering why that's important, our kids not feeling judged, it's because you can't lead people if they're feeling judged by you. The moment, and you know this for yourself, the moment someone makes you feel judged, you, with, you, you pull back from them. You withdraw from them. You to protect yourself, to keep yourself safe. Now, a really obedient child might just keep obeying you, but really in their heart, they're pulling back. The problem is, I think, in part, our today's culture wars have trained us to be intolerant, to have really strong opinions, and to be uncompassionate. And if you don't know what the culture wars are, I'll give you some examples. But basically, the culture wars are the fact that we can no longer agree to disagree on stuff. Right? So you either believe in climate change, or you are my enemy. And you're a conspiracy theorist. You're a bit of a nut job, right? You either believe there are 49 genders or however many they are, and you affirm my agenda, or you hate me, and I hate you. All right? We can't be friends. You either believe that masks and mandates saved us, or your views offend me, and we can't be friends. And we did that, didn't we? We walked away from all our friends over whatever lay of the land we chose. The whole world is offended. And I don't want you to get distracted by any of those subjects. I'm just trying to give you a sense that these are the culture wars. We're right in it. And our kids have been raised inside of this. This is the culture we're in. We're all offended. And we have to pick sides. And it's no longer okay to have a different view. But Jesus started his own culture war where the Pharisees' rules were unjust and uncaring and then unloving, Jesus was compassionate. And he was so concerned for his children that even the most broken and fallen and failing of his kids was drawn to him. We do live in difficult times. It's hard as a parent. When we have to, to go the extra mile to work out how to hold our high standards, but to have our children feel loved and accepted by us. How do we do that? I, it's something, something I'm still trying to work out to be honest. Um, I don't know. I, I reckon he, he probably didn't joke a lot about homosexuals, homosexuals or LGBTQs or loose women. Or, I don't think he commented loudly about other people's crazy lifestyles. Because if he'd done that, if he was real vocally critical or cynical or judgmental, those types of people wouldn't have... Pe people struggling with those things wouldn't have drawn near to him. They would have made him feel unsafe. He certainly wouldn't have affirmed their sin, but he also didn't make them feel judged. And are, are our kids struggling with stuff that we don't even know about? 
because you've made it, we've made it clear in our language and our unapologetic humor and cynical, judgmental view of the world. That we can't, they can't talk to us about this stuff. Do they not draw near to us because we've made it clear through our loud opinions that we're not safe to talk to? Or do we freak out when they fail? And this one's easy to do. When they fail, when they make a mistake, do we just freak out at them? And so they know they can't fail. They don't have the freedom to fail in front of us. Another thing we know about Jesus is that he wasn't harsh or angry or controlling. And these are all things that a lot of dads struggle with. Control is, is something that a lot of dads feel they need to have. And anger, control, harsh. These are things that in an effort to love well, and the commission to create his culture inside of our homes, we have to learn to master. As I said to the, the boys at youth group the other week, we are in control of the man that we're making. Right? We are in control of the man that we're making. And we have to be in control of the man that we're making because that way we can make great feeling cultures inside of our homes. And so part of our challenge is to, is to keep working on ourselves and to help our, the culture around us to feel lighter and happier. We are charged with bringing this family culture into our home and, and it's so hard. And we can get it wrong so much. Dads, we can turn up in bad ways, but we can also, when we turn up in, in good ways, it really, really matters. So I spent a fair bit of time looking at pretty much all the fatherhood research I can get um, my hands on over the last year. And um, it's really interesting when they try to define what is unique about a father. Like, as opposed to mum, what does dad bring that mum doesn't bring? And it's, um, it's actually not to do with our time, although this is importance to the time. It's, it's not that. It's not our provision. It's not how well we provide. Um, it's not even um, being really masculine, like me. Um, <laughs> but even our masculinity is not important. Um, what it is, it, it comes back to our vision. It comes back to the brightness of our vision. And it comes back to turning up um, in ways that are positive and having a really big belief in our kids. And when, that, when we turn up like that, for some reason, that intangible stuff is just transformational. And it just, homes that thrive have a dad who has a big belief in their kids. So when men master themselves a bit more each day and, and make it lighter to be around them, um, when they believe in their kids, and speak belief into their kids, it changes everything. Because just like we like to be seen by our Heavenly Father, every child wants to be seen and heard and understood by their dad. I don't know about you guys, but I know for myself 90% of this is just saying sorry. <laughs> Actually, it's probably more like 98%, <laughs> to be honest. It's just saying sorry, because I stuff it up so much, right? And there's just so much grace in this. Um, and so it's about saying sorry and then trying to work out how to do things different next time. And I also want to say divorced dads, and I'm sure uh, based on the statistics, there's a bunch of divorced dads here. Um, well, I hope there is. Um, yeah, that sounds like I hope there's a lot of divorced dads, but it's not. I'm hoping there's a lot of divorced dads. Yeah, anyway, you get the picture. Um, <laughs> I'm not hoping that a lot of you are divorced. <laughs> but, okay, I'm going to stop. Anyway, um, yeah, listen, divorce doesn't have to be the end of being a good dad. For, for many of you, it's just the beginning. And the, the, the challenge with divorce is all the parenting stuff just gets thrown out. You can't really do most of it anymore. So all you can do is focus on creating a healthy culture for your kids. Yeah, that's it. That's like 120% of it is working out how to create an environment where your kids feel seen and safe and secure 
and where your collaboration with your ex, no matter how messy that is, that you're trying to sort of create this whole environment around your, fa- your kids where they feel like they can, they can breathe and, and, and have some peace and, and where they are actually seen and heard by you. Which is what we all have to do, which is what Jesus did. He held his high standards, but he created an environment where people feel loved and accepted and seen no matter what. So happy Father's Day. <laughs> uh, I know that could have been a bit of a challenging message, but I hope it was also encouraging just to keep turning up in ways that matter. We matter, dads. We matter so much. Hold your bright vision. And just remember, we, we're here to be like Jesus, to, 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 to hold our high standards. Those are important, but also not to make our children feel judged so that they can be seen and heard by you, but also so that they can see their Father in heaven. So.